Hello, Richard. How are you? Hello, hello, Julian. I'm 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 doing well. And yourself? Uh, I'm, I'm I'm fine. Thanks. We're just discussing it and back back from a big summer break. So I'm I'm really glad to, glad to start my September season with uh, that interview in English and uh, with with someone like you. You know that has been looking at all the things I've been uh, investigating on for three years. You have been looking at this for decades, and you have been among those people, you know, trying to make sense of uh, of the trajectory of our modern civilization, and uh, which is what I, basically what I'm trying to do here at my, my little uh, level, and um, and you have uh -huh. done you, you have done this uh, this research, you know, by in, which I find very interesting by connecting all sorts of topics together by trying to think in system and by anal uh, trying to analyzing the links between energy, the economy, our civilization overall, and ecological matters. And uh, this is what I really I would like to, to talk about today with you, how to make sense of our times and how should we understand today key challenges and maybe what to do about this. Um, so, I, I mean, let's jump mm -hmm. into this. What is the situation sure. we are we are in right now as humans you know what defines our our era and how you describe this predicament this complex challenge humanity has to face right now right uh well first of all i in, in understanding any species at any time the, the most important things to take into account are population and resources And the master resource is energy. Of course, food is is a way of getting energy from the environment. And so, you know, looking at any any given species, population, and food are, you know, the two big factors. And so, if you look at human history, we've uh, we've gone through uh, a series of shifts in the ways that we extracted energy and resources from the environment. The biggest one was the advent of agriculture some, you know, eight or 10,000 years ago. But the biggest one actually in terms, in, in quantitative terms was just recently when we started using fossil fuels. We're talking about just the last 200 years. Uh, fossil fuels, of course, are an energy source But they enable us to extract other resources, you know, with tractors and steam shovels and powered equipment of all kinds. We can extract resources from the earth, transform them into products, use those products, then those products become waste. So waste is also a factor in, uh, in the life of any species. But in, in most species in ecosystems, waste gets recycled. Now, with industrial humans, the last 200 years again, um, waste has become uh, much more problematic because we're extracting so many resources. Just the process of extraction results in pollution waste. But then once we're done with those resources, there's also more waste and pollution at the end of the process. So our Our human predicament in the 20th and 21st centuries really is we've grown our population because we could, because we had the energy and resources from 1 billion at the start of the Industrial Revolution to 8 billion today. We've increased the rate at which we consume. Our per capita consumption has increased approximately 800%, about eight, eight times over in that same period of time. And the, the consequences of this are everywhere. Uh, and of course, climate change is, is one of them because we've fueled this whole process of, of growth with fossil fuels, then you know, using fossil fuels results in greenhouse gas emissions and we're changing the climate, but that's only one aspect of the situation. There, it's it's really a, uh, it, it's important to see this as a whole uh, ecological process, 
because otherwise we just get stuck on fossil fuel emissions and and we assume you know if we get rid of the greenhouse gas emissions everything is fine but it's it's not so simple this is what we call a predicament right it's some, something that's very very <laughs> complex that, that that type of problem with yeah. many different aspects to it uh what we tend to see are different symptoms and then after what you've been trying to do also is to get to the roots of all this and after decades of you know thinking and after thousands of hours of of, of writing and teaching you, you are you are just publishing a new book called power in which you you tried to go to the roots of all this and to have a systemic and holistic view on our history and uh, and on present days on that predicament right and you say in the introduction of that book how much time it took you and how many false trails it took you to manage to to get to that to synthesize this so i will talk a lot about that book and and because this is your latest work but first i would like to hear you on this process of investigation you know which beliefs you had that were wrong or too simplistic and based on that what is still commonly misleading us uh, misleading us the most when we look at the world today yeah well um i'm constantly having to revise the way i think about the world because the world is always surprising uh, i spent many years uh, using the lens of resource depletion To, to try to understand uh, the global situation. And I did that because that's one that I think we tend to ignore too much. Pollution is a little bit easier issue to understand. And that's, that's one of the reasons that I think climate change tends to get more attention than other environmental problems. So I, I spent years looking at specifically oil and fossil fuel depletion, oil, coal, natural gas, how as, as we extract these from the planet and burn them, we're drawing down the amount that's left. And this is, this is a, obviously a problem because we depend so much on these fuels. So it's, it's an important argument for reducing our reliance on fossil fuels apart from the question of climate change. So even if we dis, disregard The problem of climate change. There's still the problem of fossil fuel depletion to deal with, and it's so it's a it's a good reason for for uh, for getting off of fossil fuels. But it turns out that that's a really hard thing to understand fossil fuel depletion. And um, peak oil, as the subject was known for uh, for many years, became a a, a hot topic. You know, if you look at uh, Google searches or internet searches for the subject of peak oil, there is a huge burst of, of interest in the subject around 2003 to 2008, something like that. And then it really started to taper off. And of course, the reason was that oil companies found unconventional sources of oil, like the tar sands in Canada, the, the heavy oil in, um, in uh, Venezuela, the, the uh, tight oil in the U.S. and so on. And so the predictions about how soon global oil supplies would begin to decline turned out in most cases not to be accurate. Uh, now, there, the a inaccuracy is not, you know, really dramatic. It's probably going to amount to 10 years or something like that, the difference between some of the best forecasts and, and when the actual uh decline in world oil production happens it, it it right now it looks like it probably the peak probably occurred in in late uh, 2018 but who knows maybe the uh, the oil industry could rally once once more briefly but nevertheless you know this is an indication of how we get things wrong um and uh, and i think actually most of us are still getting Uh, a lot of things wrong with regard to climate change and our environmental predicament. And one of them is that policymakers somehow are in charge and all we have to do is change their minds and somehow we can solve all of our problems uh, relatively painlessly. And the more I 
dig into all of this, the more I understand, the more I think, well, that's sadly, that's probably not true. So that th these are, that's one of the beliefs that you, that you had that it was about solving the energy question and uh, and convincing the powerful people, and uh, and, right. and 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 then more recently you reached to the conclusion that it was something else, right? And and that something is related to uh, the dynamics of power, and uh, and let's get into this. I mean because that's a topic of your book and it's fascinating because it it makes it possible to touch on the evolution of human history on energy on uh fossil fuel as you mentioned but also on these human dynamics and uh and on why we take decisions yeah. or why we are unable to take decisions just under that word of power which is interestingly you know means different things also depending on the different languages and uh, and but, so in mm -hmm. english what is power and what are the the key elements the key principles to have in mind when before we go into more details what are we talking about right well um the english word power basically means the rate of energy transfer we speak of um the power of a solar panel or the power of an automobile engine or something like that. And these are measurable in watts or in horsepower or something like that. But we use energy to do things. And so in ordinary conversation, we say, uh, you know, the, the power of ideas or something like that. It, uh, the power of flight, the power of language. Uh, it, and these are m maybe more metaphorical ways of using the word power, but they're, they're nevertheless accurate because what they're describing is ways we use energy to do things. We also talk about social power. Uh, politicians have power. Billionaires have power. Well, this is the power to get other people to do things. Um, it, it's a way of commanding the energy of other people. So social power is also really important to understand in terms of how the world works and uh, world history and, and so on. We humans are nature's power champions. I mean, other, other species get their power basically from the sun, either directly if they're green plants or indirectly if they're, they're animals. But we humans have found ways of magnifying that power um, with, you know, wind by, by building sailboats or uh, water by capturing the, the, the energy and flowing water or with fossil fuels. Um, we've also found ways of organizing human societies so that we magnify power. Human slavery. Uh, was a way that many, many human societies used of harnessing the power of other human beings. But we also do have done this with uh, other animals, you know, harnessing animals to, to carts and chariots and, and uh, plows and, and so on. So we humans are really, really good at aggregating power, social power and physical power but it often gets us into trouble because if you have too much power that's concentrated, well, power can be addictive. Um, and people who have power typically want more of it and react violently if their power is threatened. Um, and it's, it's particularly important to understand today because we have more power, more physical power and more social power than ever before and uh, interestingly you know in french there are two words and uh for for power and i and find actually uh, one is mm -hmm. puissance which is more related to the uh, physics kind of things and the other is pouvoir which is yes. the power of doing things and i find interesting that in english it's one word as you said because it's uh it, it's actually pretty much the same thing because the the power that you have for example as someone powerful is about using power um and uh, i mean in the in the book also you and you just mentioned it but you spend a lot of time 
you argue that all of our human history is driven by that quest of, of for power, and that's actually a, a force that is found in na- nature in evolution. And uh, I would like to understand a little bit more this. You know, like is this struggle for power really hard wired into in, into us? You know, by evolution, uh, and how all these power games are. Uh, how you, how you can see them, you know, through history. How do that? Def- do they define you know, what what we do? And uh, I just want to clarify the framework. You, you know, like if you have some examples mm-hmm. um, in the book, you're talking about social power. Uh, just to understand the different forms and how they play together, and then we can go into uh, different examples too. Right. Um, well. Uh, biologists speak of what they call the maximum power principle. And this is, a, this is a, a, a general principle that's observed throughout nature, that the species that are able to aggregate or the individuals within species that are able to aggregate the most power are generally the most successful in reproducing and, uh, and surviving. So um, other species have become very good at gaining and using power in particular ways. But there are so many ways in which to gain and use power. Uh, and that's why species specialize in such such different activities. Um, with, with us, with humans, uh, I, I talked a little bit about uh, how we've gained physical power. Uh, the, the specific advantages that we've had that have enabled us to do that are our ability to make and use tools, which of course goes way back to the Stone Age, stone tools, um, and up through you know plows and weapons and domestication and, and so on. Um, and then language, which is enables us to teach other people how to make and use tools and there, thereby to make even more sophisticated tools to coordinate our behavior over time, to communicate ideas to other people, to get them to change their behavior. Um, language changed us in really profound ways. Uh, it enabled us to ask questions. And when we started asking questions like, why are we here? Um, what happens to us when we die? Well, then we used language to supply answers to those questions, which became religion, which is just a, an accidental byproduct of language. Uh, and, but then religion goes on also to be a pathway of power to get other people to conform to certain behavioral ideas or, or norms so that some people, priests or kings or, or whoever, can then have increased social power. So the, 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 the main tools, if you will, of social power have been, as we mentioned, language, but also weapons. Of course, we weapons are used to coerce other people directly or indirectly to change their behavior. Money, which is a, a concretized form of social power, very often... Uh, Economists speak of money as just a neutral medium of exchange. But we all know from our, our daily life that if you have money, you can make things happen. You can control other people's behavior. You can get other people to do things. So money is social power. And then communication tools, uh, technologies, but technologies specifically around language, around communication. So everything from writing to social media, whoever controls communication tools has a special form of social power. And usually that results in either a great deal of wealth or the ability to command the behavior of lots of other people. Yeah, it's it's in information, as you say, like who who gets the information and gets the power um, to, to do a lot of things. And I think we, we can go, go back into this a little bit later to understand uh what is the situation today uh, because we all talk about the information the era of information you know who controls information and you've got so many people controlling so much information that is that can also explain the concentration of power we have today i guess uh, 
you you mentioned this before, but uh, uh, yeah, I want to talk about modern times. Like, it's great to have your framework to understand also that these power dynamics are not new. Actually, that the the tools to uh, impose something to something else, the, the power tools are not new, and uh, and they are still the same today. Hmm. Uh, but you mentioned that something that's very new is uh, is our ability uh, for the past 150 years to tap into fossil fuels. And uh, I would like to, right. since it's it's been you, you wrote a lot of books on this, and it's still not clear, I think, for a lot of people. Maybe not those listening, but I would like to 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 hear you um, a little bit on the relationship there is between um, fossil fuel, oil, and um, the evolution of uh, the past 150 years. You know, in our modern world today, mm-hmm. because this is about power again. Yes, yes. Right. Well, I think a key concept for understanding this is the idea of a self-reinforcing feedback loop. That's where the result of some process feeds back into the, that process to make the process go even faster or, uh, or, or the, increases the magnitude of that process in some way. And that's what fossil fuels have done with just about everything that we were doing already in society. They've sped it up and they've increased the scale at which we were extracting resources, turning them into products, and turning those products into waste. They've increased the the speed of human population growth. They've increased the rate at which we expand our, our cities, our, uh, our settlements, our land use, to take space away from other species. And with the thing is this this is a the reason this is an, a self-reinforcing feedback is that the more our population grows, the more demand for energy grows. And so then we produce more energy and that causes the population to grow. The same thing with consumption rates. Uh, energy, more energy from fossil Yes, and innovation exactly. It's it's all part of uh, a a big self reinforcing feedback. Now the thing is, if you're if you're a a modeler of systems dynamics, or if you're an ecologist who studies ecosystems, self reinforcing feedbacks are dangerous things. Whenever you see one in an ecosystem uh, or or a mechanical system. You know something is wrong, and and the the system is going to come apart, or something terrible is going to happen. Uh, even when it happens, I, I'm, I happen to be a musician. Uh, we all, all of us musicians, know about feedback in amplifiers and and music. Well, if you can control that feedback, like Jimi Hendrix on his guitar, then you can create you know, interesting music that way. But generally speaking, feedback, if, if you're in a concert and, and feedback starts to happen in the sound system, you know, it's, it, it's pretty horrible. People's eardrums can get burned out or, or, or blasted out. And, but that's what we have in, in our, our human economy right now. And we're encouraging this feedback process by insisting on constantly having more economic growth. And that's, that's what's unique about this last 150 years. And that's why it's such a, a troubling moment in, in human history. And we'll get back to that also, but this is, this is why also we, it's building an illusion that this can go on forever. I guess, and and, and there is, a, yeah. it's a strong force of, uh, of denial because we don't see it because most of us, were born, and even our parents in rich country were born in a world where it's uh, um, that feedback is only positive in a sense. And so, right. so, and I want to look at the current yeah. situation because now we are consuming uh, two point five planets a year. I mean, it's an image that I find a little bit weird, but that's the idea, meaning that uh, we are overshooting, we're beyond the limits, right? And in the book, you you say that we are currently overpowered can can we talk about this and uh, of the different aspects of uh, of what that means of this overpower 
Right. Well, the, the symptoms are, are everywhere. And um, there, there are two broad categories of symptoms of over-empowerment. One is environmental. And m- most of your listeners are going to be familiar with some of with these symptoms, uh, like pollution, not only climate change, but also uh, chemical pollution of, of many kinds. Um, there are hormone mimicking chemicals derived from fossil fuels that are found everywhere in the environment. They're found at the North Pole, the South Pole. They've, they've just become uh, oh, universal plastics. throughout the environment. And these, uh, yes, then they're related to plastics. And these, these chemicals are, are changing the, uh, the, the, the sperm levels, the, the ability to reproduce, not only in humans, but also in other animals. Um, that's just pollution. Then there's resource depletion, which we talked about a little earlier. I talked about the depletion of fossil fuels, but this is happening with, with also other renewable and non-renewable resources with deforestation, with uh, basically uh, mining the fish from the sea so that they're, the, the, the fisheries are being overfished. There are fewer fisher, fish left uh, to reproduce, to supply future generations. And then non-renewable resources like, like minerals, metals, all the, the, the resources that we will need to build renewable energy infrastructure, the, uh, the, the rare earth materials, the lithium and, and uh, copper and so on that we will need in order to build batteries, solar panels, wind turbines, and, and so on. And then there's the loss of wild nature, which has been um, ignored for far too long. Something like 70% of the insects have disappeared in the last 50 years. Two-thirds of uh, vertebrate and invertebrate animals, uh, approximately, have, uh, other than insects, have also disappeared. Uh, This is true also of fish in the oceans. And some of this is happening as a result of pollution, but much of it is happening simply because we're taking habitat away from uh, other creatures. So these are environmental symptoms of over-empowerment of one species, which is us. Then there are social system uh, symptoms of over-empowerment. And here, I think just economic inequality is the, is the most obvious. You know, economic inequality has been with us for a very long time since the beginnings of, of state societies and, and agriculture, you know, five, seven, eight thousand years ago. Uh, that's when we first had kings and slavery and, and so on. Um, but it's been a, 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 a sort of battle ever since then to try to tamp down those extreme levels of inequality uh, and to empower those who had been so drastically, you know, disempowered. So getting rid of slavery and uh, and getting rid of of kings and tyrants and so on. These have been, you know, major civil rights and human rights activities over the, over the past hundreds and, and thousands of years. But the basic process of inequality, of creating economic inequality, which was set in place, you know, five, seven, eight thousand years ago, is still operating. I call it the the wealth pump. You know, at, when more resources, more energy is flowing through society, the people who already have an unequal share are able to use that social power in order to manipulate the rules of the game so that even more power or more wealth flows in their direction. So what happens is in a, in a, any given society, the level of inequality tends to increase until a crisis point is reached at, what time, at which time there's economic collapse or um, a revolution or perhaps a war or a, a, a pandemic or something like that. And then the things get rearranged and the process starts again. Well, 
in the last 150 years with fossil fuels, we've had so much new energy and resources flowing through society that there was opportunity for uh, wealth inequality of a greater scale than it had ever been seen. And that's, that's basically where we are now. Uh, we did have a couple of world wars during the 20th century, and that, that actually reduced wealth inequality very substantially. Uh, we had a Great Depression that also had an, an impact on wealth inequality. But since the end of World War II, and especially since the 1970s, inequality in most countries, and especially the U.S., has increased quite dramatically. And now we're at the point where maybe seven or eight people command as much wealth as the poorer half of humanity as you know 4 billion people and we again we've never seen wealth inequality at that scale and we know from history that when inequality becomes too great then society becomes vulnerable to collapse people lose faith in the system they tend to th think more and more that the system is rigged and unfair, and they refuse to cooperate with it, and, and the system begins to fall apart. Politics becomes more polarized. Politicians can no longer solve problems. People can't talk to their neighbors because they, they speak different political languages. Well, this is what we're seeing. So we are over-empowered, and we're seeing the symptoms of it, but we don't trace those symptoms usually back to the the processes of over empowerment that have led us to this point i would like to uh, to dwell a little bit on this um, inequality thing because as you say you've got a you know very 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 small number of people let's say you know a few thousands that own, that own you know like two thirds i don't know more than a half of the share of total wealth so that means that they are indeed yeah. concentrating a huge amount of power, of social power, as you say, because they can do a lot of things like go to space for fun, one thing, <laughs> for example, just because they can, right? Right. But also, and that's also because they, they manage to derive or to drive to themselves um, an enormous level of wealth coming from the exploitation of millions of other people working or uh, when it would be able to exp to explore information like never before, because this is also like the new way of right. accumulating, you know, wealth. And but in the end, this is fossil fuel or people working, right? I just want some people argue that we are not collectively overshooting; that uh, it's actually just a few people that are overshooting, that are uh, con concentrating too much power. Make meaning because they have a lifestyle that is, you know, a hundred times, a thousand times um, more polluting than uh, the average of the people on the planet. And also because these people are preventing change from happening. W what do you think of, of that? Of, uh, again, this is a discussion I had on social media where, and I keep, I keep reading this, like people, people are telling me, it's not about overpopulation, it's not about us you know, like flying a couple of times in a year, it's about these people in charge who won't change. Right. Well, there's there's certainly some truth to it in that there we do have, as I was just saying, extreme inequality. But the fact is that we as a species have become over-empowered in terms of the rate at which we use resources and the and the growth of our population. I mean, the, our our rate of resource use is partly a function of our population increase, and it's partly a function of the per capita rate of resource consumption. And it's true there are there are, uh, you know a couple of billion very poor people uh, in the global south whose rate of consumption is very minimal. I mean, they're they're not the problem in a sense, except that, you know, by increasing their, their population, they are putting more pressure on their local ecosystems and environments and, and causing species 
in those ecosystems and environments to, you know, uh, go extinct and, and, and be pressured out of existence. So, <clears throat> yes, it's true that some people are more at fault than others, but we also have to take into account just the over empowerment of us humans as a species. And if we don't come to terms with that, if we just think that, you know, getting rid of a few rich people is going to solve the problem, then unfortunately, I think we're deluding ourselves. Uh, so I, I would like to to try to summarize a bit at this point. We what we just said we ha so we have a ecological crisis already happening that you you know you provide some provided some figures. And we have climate change that is already becoming a very real problem for you know millions of people and threatens more millions of, of lives you know in a matter of uh, years or decades. And we have energy crisis coming, and we have uh, sorry I'm laughing because. <laughs> Just nervously, and we have a crisis in our in our democracy. You know, like uh, because we're unable to reach consensus and just to just to look at things as they are. So this is kind of a, our predicament. And in the point you are making with this right. book, the conclusion you reach after those decades of looking at this is that the deep source of all this is our pursuit pursuit of power as a species, and the fact that we ended up ended up being overpowered because well nothing for now is limiting us that that's a good summary <laughs> <laughs> right yeah uh, yeah so far so good so I, I would like to look at the implications you know of this diagnostic as it seems then that uh, there are a lot of misunderstandings uh, around what is at play you know in the media or in the political world so if the source of our problem is that we are overpowered collectively that means that the only way to get out of the weeds is to reduce our consumption of power, right? To self-limit our power. So mm -hmm. isn't that the biggest misunderstanding today? You know, because can we keep growing our economies, our energy consumption, our population, improve our lifestyles, and solve, let's say, just climate change, you know, climate crisis? Because yeah. this is this is what yeah. almost all the people in charge are saying right now. Right. Yes, and uh, I, I've I've spent years just on on this point um, alone, uh, looking at the question of whether renewable energy from solar and wind can enable a modern industrial society to continue growing and. My conclusion is that it can't. I, I worked with uh, uh, David Fridley, who's on the energy analysis team at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory for a year, uh, specifically on this question. And we, we wrote up our results as a book called Our Renewable Future. And our, our conclusion was that uh, solar and wind can't do it. And the reason is that, uh, well, actually, it's a... <laughs> It's kind of a complicated discussion, and we could just spend the rest of the time talking about about this, but I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, solar and wind produce electricity, and they do it directly without having to burn something, which is, which is great. But sunlight and wind are intermittent. The, the sun isn't always shining, the window isn't always blowing. So we have to find ways to store energy. And that actually costs energy and resources. Uh, we have to have redundant generation capacity uh, in different places that's all connected by way of uh, super grids. And then we have to electrify all the ways that we're using energy uh, currently that don't involve electricity, which is transportation, industrial processes, um, <clears throat> agriculture, all kinds of really important things. 80% of our energy consumption currently involves energy sources other than electricity. So that 80% of energy consumption is going to be, in many cases, difficult to electrify. Just look at aviation. Can we have electric planes traveling from you know, Paris to New York carrying 300 people? Well, no, it's not, that's not going to happen. 
yes, we could have smaller electric aircraft in certain situations doing, you know, carrying a few people here and there. Companies are looking into that. It's, it's feasible. It's expensive, but it's feasible. So how do you, how do you, uh, take care of these other things? Well, you can create synthetic fuels by using lots of electricity from wind turbines and solar panels like to hydrogen, right? make hydrogen from water. And hmm. yeah, and, and then use the hydrogen to make methanol or something like that. But this is very in, energy inefficient, and it's also very expensive. <clears throat> then you have the problem, if we try to do all of this <clears throat> very quickly in a short amount of time, you know, we're, we're trying to be carbon neutral, uh, net zero emissions by 2050 in order to avert catastrophic climate change. If we try to do all of this in, t- in 20 or 30 years, the result will actually be a huge pulse of carbon emissions. Why? Because building all of this infrastructure, not just the solar panels and wind turbines, but the electric vehicles and the, a, an entirely new generation of industrial equipment that is either using electricity or synthetic fuels, building a whole new uh, industry of creating synthetic fuels and storing them and transporting them and, and so on, which would basically replicate our current fossil fuel industry. But we couldn't just use the, 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 the oil plants and natural gas plants that we already have because uh, we're, we're talking about different fuels with different char- characteristics needing their own you know, unique production processes. When you, you know, building all of that requires energy. And where is that energy going to come from? Well, in the, in the initial phases, at least, it has to come from fossil fuels because, because that's 80% of the energy that we have right now. So there's no way around it. If we try to uh, build enough renewable energy infrastructure to enable us to continue using energy at current rates, the result will be, again, a big pulse in carbon emissions, which is exactly what we're trying to avoid. So the only way to solve the climate problem is to reduce our normal energy usage for transportation, uh, producing consumer products, and, and so on, while we build alternative energy. And that, that solves the problem in two ways. First of all, it takes the pressure off dur- the, the transition itself. And then after the transition, we'll be using less energy. So we, we don't need to build as big a, uh, uh, an energy infrastructure. So no, there's no way we can do it all. We have to choose. And that would mean, t- so using less energy or learning to use less energy quickly that would mean what for our economies? Well, it, it, it means no more growth because growth requires energy. Now, there, there are economists and politicians who listen to economists who say that we, we can have it all just by making the economy ever more efficient. But you know, investments in efficiency are subject to diminishing returns. And a lot of industrial processes and technologies are already pretty efficient. We've been working at this for, for decades. LED lights are already extremely efficient, uh, as just one example, or electric motors in all kinds of common objects, including electric cars, already very efficient. We may gain a little bit more at the margins, but not that much. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, the kinds of energy usage reduction that we're t- talking about are going to entail a reduction in economic activity overall. And of course, nobody wants to contemplate that. Nobody wants to talk about it. No politician wants to campaign on the platform of, you know, elect me and I will cause the economy to contract. <laughs> it, it's not going to happen. So, so this is a huge problem because it means that our, our political system may not be capable of solving the climate crisis. Well, it's interestingly, we have 
elections in, in you know presidential elections in France next year and there is actually one candidate campaigning on that idea of degrowth but but you can see how ah, how, well, how well this is received you guys you can imagine by <laughs> by and, and this is not well received because 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 that link is not understood that link between energy yeah. climate and the economy is not understood and uh, I actually have other episodes on this so I, I won't spend too much time but I would like I would like to talk about the economic system a little bit more as for a, a lot of people that look into this into this predicament this problem um for a lot of them it's about capitalism you know it's capitalism that's mm -hmm. that's that's that is at the root of all our troubles and uh, what do you think of this idea is it about the system that is in place and can capitalism limit its appetite for power and also for creating inequalities yeah well uh short answer to your your last question is no i don't think capitalism can do that um capitalism was a prerequisite for our our fossil fuel era in other words we wouldn't have become addicted to fossil fuels if we hadn't had capitalism. Uh, and actually, we, we have a historical experiment to show that because a thousand years ago, uh, China actually began an industrial revolution uh, using coal and uh, as a result of basically capitalism, there was privatization uh, of land and other things. Privatization was going on in China. And investment, government was, was supporting investment in new technologies. There was all sorts of innovation happening. And so uh, coal consumption was rapidly increasing. And it really looked for all the world like an industrial revolution. But then the government saw this as a threat to their political power, and they shut it down. So instead of the Industrial Revolution happening in China around 1,200 AD, it happened in Europe and North America you know, 800 years later. But it wouldn't have happened in Britain. Uh, it wouldn't have started in Britain if not for, again, privatization and government protection for investment, basically corporations. This was the 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 legal and and economic framework that enabled the fossil fuel revolution to happen. But that said, you know, does that mean that if we get rid of capitalism, then all of our problems are solved? Well, no, it doesn't, because we still have our current levels of uh, population and consumption to deal with, and as long as we have that, then we're still in this in the same fix. Now, I think we we will have to deal with with capitalism, with private ownership of resources. It's that's just something that sh should not happen. I mean, what what person, what company uh, created you know underground deposits of coal or copper or uh, fresh water or any of these things? Nature did that. So why should any human being claim ownership? over what nature has provided. It does, just doesn't make sense. But in the logic of capitalism, that's, that's how the economy works. We have to change that. Um, now, could capitalism survive the end of growth? That's a question I hear a, a lot. And I think it actually probably could for a while. Uh, even once the economy starts to shrink, Capitalism probably can survive for a while just by consuming what's left of, you know, people and nature and, you know, by the, uh, kidnapping people for ransom could become a big capitalist, <laughs> you know, uh, nice. among other kinds of things, you know, ran ransomware, all of these things are, yeah. are basically capitalist enterprises that take advantage of the of processes of social decay and, and collapse. Um, so yeah, capitalism could still be with us for a while, but uh, 
but and you argue, uh, you argue that this is a problem ultimately because, because this is a system that is optimizing power right that that is power angry by nature right Okay. Exactly. That's that's the that's really is the ultimate nature of capitalism itself. It's a system that that aims to concentrate power in the hands of a few people. Hmm. And so, of course, uh, especially in the context of having fossil fuels, it, it's a recipe for disaster. So, what's the alternative? Like, is there an an optimum? power principle, meaning a system in which we could be capable of limiting our power so that we can, you know, solve that and then flourish for a longer period of time. And if it exists, why does it appear that, you know, humans are failing to restrain their power and are willing to risk literally everything, you know, right now in pursuit of it? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's one of the central questions that I, I address in the book, um, because if if we're designed by evolution to pursue power and nothing else, then you know there's really no hope at all. But I don't think that's the case. You know, we we see the the effort to moderate power everywhere in nature, um, even in our own bodies. We have what's called homeostasis. It's, it's a way of you know, bodily functions remaining in dynamic balance over time. We see the same thing in ecosystems with predator-prey population dynamics. Um, some species uh, are, you know, just reproduce as, as long as there's food or space, they'll just reproduce and reproduce until they hit hard limits and then their population will crash. Other species take a different route. Um, uh, one example is the, the American pika, which is a little rabbit-like uh, uh, creature that's found mostly in the Rocky Mountains in the American West. Uh, these kinds of species, and there are many of them, uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of species in, in, that fit this description, they specialize on rare food sources and rare habitats where very few of them are able to live at any any one time or in any one place. So their population is always very low, but it tends to be very stable. So there, that's why there are lots of these species, because they tend to persist over a long time. So they've, they, these are species that have traded the kind of boom and bust dynamism of you know, other species for a kind of stability. So human beings, we can do the same thing. And we have, there are human societies that have been boom and bust kinds of societies, lots of civilizations, the Roman empire, you know, of course we're doing the same thing right now, but there've also been human societies that have maintained themselves fairly in a fairly stable way for hundreds and thousands of years. We also have institutions, uh, ways of checking and challenging power. Democracy was, is at least in part a way of keeping tyrants from gaining too much social and political power. Uh, we have, uh, we, we tax rich people at higher rates than poor people in order to prevent economic inequality from getting too extreme within societies. And then we pro provide government programs, healthcare, education, and so on to poorer people, again, to help balance the scales so that uh, economic power doesn't become too, uh, too concentrated in, in society. So the second part of your question is, if we can do these things, if we have a history of limiting the concentration of power, if it's possible because it, it happens elsewhere in nature, then why aren't we doing it now? Why haven't we already solved climate change? And the reason is, again, it goes back to fossil fuels and, and I suppose capitalism too. We got so much so fast that we came to believe that there are no limits, that we can do anything that uh, there, there is no 
carrying capacity limit for human beings on planet Earth. We can continue to grow our population ad infinitum. We can continue to grow our per capita consumption rates forever. And of course, that sounds crazy when you put it that way, but that is literally the assumption at the basis of our current economic and political system. Uh, and as long as we have that assumption in place, then of course we're we're headed toward catastrophe. And 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 the wealthiest people, those who have the most power, currently believe that they can, as I said, you know, have fun doing tourism in space or ambition to go on Mars and, <laughs> and, and do things. That that's very reassuring, Richard. That's <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, yeah, I know. But how how do we? how do we limit our individual and collective power in a world where the first who starts doing this can be taken over, you know, can lose to the first neighbor who plays another game. Uh, and, you, you know, you take the example of civilizations that could last for centuries doing this until another powerful civilization next door comes and conquests them, basically. Mm -hmm. So isn't there a kind right. of pris prisoner dilemma here uh, isn't it and and we can understand also like the fears of those who say that it's suicide for example for a nation or, or a company to limit itself because in the end you would lose power you will lose market shares or you will lose sovereignty and this is something that we hear a lot yeah what's the yeah what's the, the you're, trigger you're there? absolutely right well there, um, game theory provides solutions to the pris prisoner's dilemma. And again, we see this in, in human societies that have learned self-limitation. Usually they did this as a result of trial and error. You know, when, it, when human beings first arrive in a new environment, and we're talking many thousands of years ago, when people first got to the Pacific Islands, for example, First thing they did was kill off the big game animals because this was a, a cheap, easy source of, of food. But then over time, they realized that, you know, once, once you do that, once they're gone, then, then what do you do? You have to, you have to limit yourself if you're going to have a stable existence over time. So indigenous societies all over the planet developed traditional ways of sharing resources and of limiting consumption, limiting the taking of resources. And uh, some of these uh, traditional methods are really ingenious. Uh, they're being studied by anthropologists all the time as a way of, of modeling how modern industrial societies can, can share and preserve, conserve uh, resources. So it can be done. But again, typically it happens as a result of trial and error. So we are in the process of generating a bunch of errors <laughs> in terms of climate change and, and all the rest. The question is, how quickly will we learn? And how quickly can we, you know, thereby, you know, internalize this learning into new institutions, new traditions, new attitudes? Uh, beliefs and assumptions that enable us to collectively self-limit. This obviously, this is not an easy answer to the question, but this is the only answer that I've been able to come up with. And couldn't it be a convincing argument to to those who fear, you know, losing power, to say that, you know, in the long term those with the most power will be those who are accepted to lose some power in the short term in order to better prepare the future. So <clears throat> it, it is still, we are still in the Nietzschean, you know, race for power, but it's not about growing. It's about decreasing less than the others in the end. Is it so? Does it make sense? Or? Well, there, there's also there's also status to be achieved by giving things away. And even Bill Gates and, and some, some of the other billionaires, you know, seek to gain social status by giving away some of their power. 
Uh, and again, this has this has roots in traditional si- societies that go way back, where the 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 big man in in the the group gained his status by giving everything away. And only the difference is, you know, somebody like Gil- Bill Gates doesn't give everything away. He just, yeah. <laughs> you know, a, a certain percentage. But to to really have status, to be like uh, the Buddha, for example, who who did the same thing. gave He he was born a prince, gave everything away, and gained status as a teacher of how to live. Okay, so this this is we really need to go all the way with this, and not just uh, not not just part way. Yeah, I have another question for you on this later because I want to spend more time now. Um, if you still have some time, let me know if we if I need to rush. But um, I would like to spend some time discussing about what's next and uh, and what to do about it. Like, thanks, we have one hour of diagnostic. I think it's super interesting, super clear now uh, to understand the power dynamics. But you, yeah, you've spent decades with some of your you know fellows of your friends explaining what is going on since the 70s, basically. And you have witnessed how much that was successful. <laughs> and we are, we are in a far worse situation, you know, compared to where we were, you know, 40 years ago. So do you think that today there is something different happening? You know, as some say, a new generation or... Uh, you know, a reckoning like events like fires, hurricanes, flooding that could really trigger something and, and ignite change in that trajectory? Or is it just the history repeating itself and you don't believe it? Uh, well, I, I do think that the, the younger generation now is aware that there are unique and overwhelming problems that they're facing for which they have not been adequately prepared. Um, I think a lot of them feel that they've been betrayed by older generations, by people in my generation, for example. And I think they're right. Um, We have not prepared them for what's coming. We have prepared them to be uh, information workers, or managers of systems that are inherently unsustainable. Uh, very few of them know how to maintain themselves in wild nature or how to understand how nature works. Uh, it's, the, it's largely a, a generation that's grown up in an urban context, surrounded by machines and electronic gadgets. And yet they have um they have a future ahead of them in which so much of that is going to break down and they're going to have to know somehow or have to figure out how to maintain life in the context of a changing climate of collapsing economic system and and all the rest so people in my generation really owe it to these younger folks to help them in any way we can, to, not just to understand the situation, which I spend much of my time doing, but in practical ways. Um, young farmers, for example, there, there are young people who would like to become, let's say, organic farmers, but very few of them have access to land because land has become ridiculously expensive and it's already owned by people in my generation. So we need to give up power now to people in in the younger generation to enable them to begin to solve the problems that we have created and are bequeathing them. That's that's <laughs> but, but but so so what's um I would like, yeah, I would like to spend time on this, on the concrete things, because what, what's our pathway to avoiding mm-hmm. first? Because there are two aspects. One is avoiding the worst to happen, and the other one is getting ready. I, I want to talk about these two different way of uh, yeah. kind of, you know, acting. So, what sure. is there a pathway to avoiding the worst outcomes during the rest of this century? Because you know, there are a lot of climate groups, social justice groups, anti-war groups, and 
you know, all sorts of organizations, activists. Uh, do you think that they have a chance mm -hmm. of shifting society's current tra trajectory? And, um, or are we ab aboard kind of a doomsday machine, as you wrote in one of your articles? Yeah. Well, in a sense, we are, uh, because I don't, I don't think that we can salvage uh, our economic system and our social system as they're currently configured. So that has to change. But there are already lots of idealistic people who are trying to change those systems in ways that may, may make them more survivable over the long run. So we're, we're talking about idealistic people in who were working in, in food systems, political systems, social systems, economic systems, and, and so on. Um, these people need to be aware of each other and supportive of each other so that it's a united campaign, if you will, sort of an anti-collapse coalition. Right now, unfortunately, it's largely disparate. So you have climate change people over here, social justice activists over there, anti-war people over here. And generally speaking, these, these people don't talk to each other that much, or when they do, they're competing with one another for funding from uh, found, philanthropic foundations. And that's, that's not a recipe for success. See, w one of the problems with our, our, our current situation is that people who want to do good things get involved out of necessity in the nonprofit world of, you know, NGOs. And these NGOs or nonprofit organizations are funded by foundations, which then depend upon economic growth in order to maintain themselves in order to, they, they don't, if the economy isn't growing, then they're not giving out money to NGOs. So how does, if, if economic growth is part of the problem, then this is not a situation that's, that's, that's likely to work. So you really have to have people who are dedicated to making these kinds of changes, whether, uh, whether they're in, a the philanthropic world, a nonprofit world, or outside of that whole world, just working voluntarily or uh, even in, in small for-profit companies. Uh, all of these folks have to, have to find ways of working together. That's interesting also because you, you have a lot of people that argue that, uh, you know, you need to, to work within the system because this is where the money is, this is where power is, mm. and this is the biggest lever. Uh, and, and I have a question related to that. What are the you know the most important levers to try to pull? The, the some some people call them the ac acupuncture points. You know that could be tipping points because and uh, and the most convincing argument i hear for example is that we need to change our culture and our values we need to change uh, and redefine right. status you mentioned it before and today high status is granted to those who are managing to accumulate you know money um, and whatever the cost short term and long term so you know when when we should give high status to behavior that benefit all of us in the long term but but can we change this or is it or the, or, or the power difference is just too high too big you know like to 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 be done i'm, yeah. I'm curious to, to hear you on the concrete levers you know wh where where to focus on and and how to focus on mm -hmm. well um you by doing this podcast and i by writing books and and doing interviews and so on, we're basically trying to change people's awareness and their thinking, the way they think, the way they understand the world. I don't know if that's going to be enough. Certainly, we need more than that. We need uh, examples of things like eco-villages where people are experimenting with different ways of, of living together, of making decisions, of providing food and clothing and, and so on in, in ways that are more sustainable. Is, is any of this enough? Well, it depends on enough for what. 
is it enough to ensure that our current way of life will will somehow survive? No, I don't think I don't think that's possible under any circumstances. But can we at least make the the transition better, more survivable? The can we m- reduce the casualties, human casualties, and the casualties in the natural world? Can we minimize those and the suffering? Can we provide a better life? For future generations of humans who will follow this, this uh, after this turning point in 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 human experience, well, we have to we have to do what we can, and time will only tell if it's you know enough. I don't I don't know if the word enough really is meaningful in this situation. Because there is also a debate, you know, within those who are uh, thinking of these issues. Because some say we, we we really need to focus on, as you mentioned, preparing what's coming, and uh, and it's a waste of time to try to stop that doomsday machine. And some other people say, no, 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 we we need to work on that. What's your? I mean, let's play a little bit of foresight gain. Uh, knowing all what you know, and you know, what do you think will happen in in the coming years and decades? Uh, I know it's very you you cannot say exactly, but mm-hmm. it looks like you no. have a, an opinion on that well, <laughs> on the on the on the trajectory. <laughs> Generally speaking, I think what we're in for is a series of cascading crises, and. Uh, Initially, at least, they're likely to be localized. In other words, some countries or some regions during certain periods will suffer greatly as a result of a natural disaster or economic, social, and political disaster. Um, And if I can identify some that are more likely to suffer certain kinds of of crises, the American West is in for more of wildfires, droughts, and other kinds of ecological problems caused, caused by climate change. Other regions of North America are probably less likely in in the short term to experience those things, but the United States as a nation is extremely vulnerable right now to political and social unrest and even collapse. Uh, I don't know if the United States as a political entity will, will exist in a recognizable form in 10 years if the pr- process of political polarization that we're seeing right now continues to unfold. So, um, yeah, some of some of these things are identifiable, some less so. But what what the overall the overall shape of things is a series of crises punctuated by periods of retrenchment and recalibration and recovery. Uh, so there will be periods when uh, people, at least in certain places, will feel like, well, we've seen the worst of it, and now we can begin to rebuild. And that will continue for a while until the next series of, of crises starts to, to hit. And this process will continue until human population and consumption levels are within the sustainable, uh, a, 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 a level that's sustainable by remaining resources given what's happening with climate change. And I, I don't think anyone can say, you know, where that, that final leveling off place will be, but it's going to take us a while to get there. And the process is not going to be much fun. So a big degrowth of everything, just as uh, the models of the <laughs> you know, limits to growth, Meadows report projected yeah. 50 years ago, right? Um. When people tell you that you're pessimistic, how do you feel? What, what do you answer them? Um, 
I think that's that, that's sort of a meaningless statement or accusation. I'm just trying to uh, see what's happening and communicate that accurately. Uh, whether somebody sees that as pessimistic or optimistic is some people think I'm optimistic. Actually, uh, it, it might be surprising to some some folks who are listening here, but I I get told uh, quite regularly that I'm I'm uh, just irrationally optimistic about the future. Just by saying that, you know, we're actually capable of, of limiting ourselves and that we, you know, over time we may learn to do so. And it's possible that we'll achieve a sustainable culture in, uh, you know, maybe by the end of the century or so. Um, I, I don't think that's overly optimistic. I think that's a, that's a, a, a real possibility. But on the other, you know, other side of the equation, I don't think it's pessimistic. To be talking about the kinds of, of events that we've just been describing, that's it's it's well within the the range of what all of the climate scientists and ecologists, uh, resource experts, and energy experts that I've talked to over the last several decades say is um, you know, yeah. quite real, quite rational. Again, this is all based on serious science, and not just opinions. No. Oh. So, the, actually, maybe understand why uh, some of your colleagues that have the same level of information as you do would, would call you an optimistic. It, the, the book features several sections about beauty and uh, its role in evolution in human society, and you even say that we may have a beautiful future ahead of us. Well, let's go into this. What do you mean by that? Well, um, nature is intentionally beautiful. I mean, be beauty is subjective. Yes, that's true. But in nature, sexual selection, which uh, Darwin identified as a, a major factor in evolution back in the 19th century. Sexual selection results in individuals within species competing to produce aesthetic pleasure in their, their potential mates, right? So the fact that you know, we look out at the natural world and we see flowers and we hear birds singing and we see beautiful plumage and everything appears so, so gorgeous in the natural world. It's not an accident and it's not just a subjective impression. Nature is trying to be as beautiful as it can. And we human beings, in addition to gaining all of this other power of social power and money and, and energy sources and all the rest have also gotten extremely good at pr pr producing aesthetic bounty, you know, art and music and culture and mathematics and all of this stuff that is extraordinarily beautiful. And it's not just for sexual selection. Sexual selection gets the ball rolling, but, you know, maybe a a teenage boy goes out and buys a guitar so he can learn how to play and, and impress the girls, right? Okay, maybe that starts the process. <laughs> but if he's serious about it and he practices, he's going to realize that playing the guitar is really cool and really fun in, in a, just as a, a, a private experience, even if he never performs for anyone, just sitting at home and practicing and figuring things out, chords and scales and, and stuff. It's it's wonderful stuff. Well, you know, we, we have commercialized the arts just as, you know, because we have a, we're in a capitalist culture. And I think that has resulted in a kind of aesthetic decadence that has diminished our lives to, to an unnecessary degree. But if we can get past this phase of human evolution, characterized by capitalism and and environmental overshoot and so on if we start to devote ourselves more toward the creation of beauty that's something that is not inherently destructive from an environmental point of view i mean you know building uh making our structures as beautiful as possible 
producing music together, uh, m- making beautiful things, doesn't uh, doesn't result in the extinction of species unless we're doing it in in really uh, in absurd ways. It just makes the world a, a better place, and ultimately, I think we're going to find this is the way to channel our outsized human abilities of language and tool making and all the rest in a way that doesn't imperil future generations. If humanity is going to have a future, I think it's going to have to be a beautiful future because that's, that's, that's the path that will enable us to be a species that deserves to survive. What what is your advice for a, a piece of advice for anyone who is uh, becoming aware of the situation we talked about? Uh, and that that's also a very personal question here because <laughs> now I'm, I'm starting to be very yeah. well aware after <laughs> you know, years of investigation. Um, how to and, and the question I'm asking myself now is how to live a, a life, you know, a, a good life, a positive life in the, in this century. Yeah, that's a very important question. Well, first of all, is is be a good person, be a sociable person, help other people. Because if you're if you're a trustworthy person and a helpful person, then people will trust you, and you will be able to recognize when other people are being trustworthy and helpful, and you will naturally naturally associate and. Under the circumstances that that we're we're headed toward, you want to be around trustworthy people. You don't want to be around other kinds of people. But in order to associate with with trustworthy people, you have to be a trustworthy worthy person yourself. So be sociable, help others, and spend time in the natural world. Get to know how nature works. Uh, learn how to be more self-sufficient, grow some of your own food, take a class in what's called primitive technology, which is learning how to, you know, make a fire from scratch or, or make string out of, uh, you know, plant material that's growing in, in your backyard or, or whatever. Even if you don't ever end up relying on those skills directly, it will make you a more, um, confident and competent person in the world. Because right now, we're all so reliant on systems that are outside our control, huge systems, banks and supermarkets and and gas stations and all the rest, and political systems beyond our control, that it, it really, from a psychological standpoint, it's extremely important to get in touch with life at its most basic uh, elements. Where we are, you know, directly in contact with with the, the sources of our of our nourishment and survival. So that's that's what I recommend to uh, to especially to young people, but to anyone. Yeah, I guess I have a question to, that I always ask in the end about how what should I tell my two little girls in, <laughs> if I want them to be happy and stay yeah. on as long as possible. But I, but I also want them to be, yeah, to, to, to be ready to live in, in this world. I, you, you said it. I, I don't think it's very much, your answer would be very much different, but, uh, uh, as, right. It's about starting as early as possible. Yeah, help may, Make sure they have experiences of, of nature and uh, taking them camping, for example, so mm-hmm. that they feel comfortable in the natural world, I think that's really important. And and if there, if you live somewhere where it's possible to have a garden, um, so many young people now really don't know. They don't know where their food comes from. It's all theoretical. It's all abstract. You know, it comes from the supermarket, and uh, and that's that's no way to live. That's no way to to think about the world. Do you have <clears throat> to, uh, that's the, the last question do you have do you have two books that uh, or two type two contents two books that everyone should should read that could help uh, you know living a good life in in today 
Mm. That's a tough question to answer because as you can see, I'm surrounded by books <laughs> and they're all good. But I, you know, if I had to choose two, I'd say Limits to Growth, which you mentioned earlier, which was published almost exactly 50 years ago. It'll be 50 years in, in 2022 because it was published in 1972. Everybody should read that book once in their, in their life. I think it's the most important book of the 20th century. And the other is a much older book, the Tao Te Ching of Lao Tzu, um, the, the foundational text of Taoism. And we don't even know if Lao Tzu existed or, you know, who really wrote it or exactly when. Um, but it's an example of people thinking in a way that's, that's universal, that's, that's meaningful in all times and places. And that, um, is, you know, is philosophically sound. Uh, I, I, I read both books when I was, I guess, around 21 years old, and they both shaped my worldview um, for my entire adult life. And I still pick both of them up once in a while and, uh, and reread, uh, especially the, the Tao Te Ching. Well, I think, thanks a lot for this. And uh, yeah, it's been an hour and a, and a half of a very dense and <laughs> Very interesting information. Th thanks a lot, Richard, for your time. It's a pleasure speaking with you, Julian. Take care. Voilà, j'espère que cet épisode vous a plu. Vous pouvez, comme d'habitude, retrouver les notes détaillées et les infos complémentaires sur sismic.fr. Si le podcast vous plaît, parlez-en, mettez une note sur Apple Podcast. Et pour ne rien rater, rejoignez-moi sur les réseaux sociaux ou abonnez-vous à la newsletter. Je suis Julien Devorex. Sismic est un podcast indépendant et je me consacre désormais entièrement à ce projet. Pour me soutenir dans cette démarche et rejoindre la communauté privée Slack, vous pouvez faire un don à partir du site. Enfin, si vous souhaitez échanger avec moi ou me solliciter pour une conférence, contactez-moi pour en parler. Merci encore pour votre écoute et à bientôt dans un autre épisode. <rire> changer le monde <rire> Quelle drôle idée Il est très bien comme ça, le monde pourrait changer 